morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, hold your greatest fear for a while. Because uh, it's going to tie into the uh, teaching uh, and, and, uh, in a few minutes. So I'll kind of take a pause and find out uh, what those were. I, I really wanted to ask you what is your greatest fear, but I thought, you know, that really bashed into a corner. So I gave you multiple choice. You know, name one of them. Okay? And that way you can name the one that you feel most comfortable with at the table. Alright, so I gave you a little bit of an out. I was in a very gracious and kind mood this morning, but I'll get over it before the uh, day is uh, before the day is over. This is a couple of things. Another great week. Thank you guys for social media. Uh, if you're not on the Facebook uh, 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 journey, uh, life group page, you need to do that. We're uh, uh, buzzing out there this week. Uh, it posted 500 views again and uh, little weekly video. So thank all of you for not just getting it, uh, hopefully watching it and sharing it and passing it on. Just keep, uh, keep doing that. Uh, very, very helpful. Very, very helpful. Okay? Now, let me, I haven't said anything about it, but uh, somebody asked me uh, last week, Jimmy, I don't remember, it was a new person, how do I get access to the full teaching? All you gotta do is just Google uh, Jimmy Not Journey Class, and it'll, uh, it'll uh, take you to archives, uh, uh, frankly here at the website of the church, and uh, you can uh, uh, watch uh, those again. I encourage you to do that. Uh, those of you who know me, I tend to teach a series every teaching. Okay, I cover a lot of material, and uh, so sometimes it may be helpful to go back and to and to listen uh, again to uh, uh, what's been taught. Okay, all right. Open your Bibles or your device, uh, uh, whatever you use, uh, put a little bit, just a little bit of review, and then pick up some new, uh, some new uh, material. We're in a series, the demands of discipleship. In Matthew chapter 10, uh, specifically verses 24 and following, where I think Jesus has uh, His most complete and one place teaching about what it means to be a follower of His, what it means to be a disciple, what are the demands, the expectations of Jesus as someone who comes into a relationship with Him and wants to follow Him. And last week in verses 24 and 25, in fact, uh, I'll read that, Jesus says a disciple, follower, learner, follower of Jesus is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough. It's sufficient. It's adequate. It should be all that we would aim for in our journey for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. And that is the upside. What you were saying, what, what's the bottom line? What's the bottom line demand? Bottom line expectation to be a follower of Christ. It would be to become as much like Jesus, attitude, belief, behavior, value, priorities, as we possibly can. That should be a, a, a thought on our mind when we get up every day. How today can I be more like Him? Though we can't fully achieve that because we're on faultless and sinfulness, we can certainly aim higher probably than we do a lot of times. Shooting a little bit higher uh, in our journey. And then on the downside, he says, if you're going to be more and more like me, let me be honest with you and tell you, you're going to probably then be treated like I was treated. Just total honesty. This is what he said in verse 25. If they call the master of the house, Beelzebub, David, uh, that was part of the message right this weekend, yeah, uh, Satan or the devil, okay? how much more will they malign those of his household? In other words, if they treated me in the way that they treated me, ultimately killing me, do not be surprised. In fact, expect that you're going to be treated like I was treated. And uh, over in uh, John 15 and 16, he basically says, but remember, it's really not about you. That would develop pride in us. It's really more about me in you that they're mad at. Okay, so let's not be arrogant. Look at your great eye. No, it's Jesus in us. It's not... It's, uh, it's not us. So, becoming a disciple, frankly, relatively easy. Living that out, nothing could be more demanding. Turn back to Matthew, turn back to Matthew chapter uh, 7. Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew 7, we're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching either this long message or a series of messages 
uh, there on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee to a very uh, religious, uh, frankly, audience. And when he gets to verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate. He just said, I'm the gate. It's narrow. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to light. Those who find it are few. We don't read that a lot. It's really a sobering statement of Jesus saying, listen, it's easier just to go your own way and do your own thing than it is to say yes to God, yes to Jesus, yes to the demands of discipleship and to live those out. That is hard. That is extremely difficult. Now go back to Matthew uh, 10. Matthew uh, 10. Pick up in verse 16. You've got to... We've got to get into the sandals of the disciples who are hearing this. Jesus has called them. He has named them. He has instructed them in Matthew 10. And then He tells them, here's, here's the reception you're going to get. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, you should not be anxious of how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated for all my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, then flee to the next. For I truly say to you, you will have not gone through all of the uh, towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. You hear that. And they say, you hear that. What is the natural reaction to that? You let me answer that. What is your natural reaction? For me, and I think it's what Jesus anticipates for most, it is not, yeah, baby, bring it on. <laughs> Don't think so. I think it's fear. I think it's fear. You know, yeah, I want Jesus, and yes, I want forgiveness, and yes, I want joy, and yes, I want peace, and yes, I want purpose, and yes, I want hope. So I don't want persecution, and I don't want pain. And, and, and I don't want difficulty, and I don't want hardship. So Jesus honestly tells them, it's going to be demanding to follow so that natural reaction is fear. And fear has to be one of the strongest emotions. One of our strongest emotions. Uh, when I asked you a moment ago, what is you want of your greatest fears? Okay? Shout out. Fire on airplane. Flying on an airplane. Fire. Fire. Fire on an airplane. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I never fly again. I have never had that thought. Never had that thought. Now I will never get on an airplane without having that thought. Thank you, Colleen, for ruining my life. Okay. All right. Does anyone have one that's uh, less fearful? Where? Heights. Heights. Fear of heights. Okay. Obviously, I don't have that problem. That's why I stay short. Okay. Fear of heights. We got struck by lightning on an airplane yesterday. They got struck by lightning on an airplane yesterday. Did you have fire? We did not know it did not, but we were we were waiting to pull out from the uh, from the, the gate from, from, from the jet bridge. Yeah. The jet bridge got stuck. Struck. We got struck. Anyway, fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Yes. Fear of rejection. Okay. I don't have any idea what that has to do with the airplane. But it is. Somebody else? Divorce. What? Divorce. Divorce. Fear of divorce. Breaking the relationships. Absolutely. Very, very real. When you just think of yours, and mine's failure. One of mine. That's, that's one of mine. Okay. Uh, those of you who know me for a long time, 
Fear is an attitude and emotion that I have trouble with all of my life. Constantly, I feel like battling it. Some days, some hours, some moments are better than other hours. Uh, I'd like to tell you that there are only one or two of those. It's just a lot. It's just one of the ways the enemy tries to get you know, into my journey. But did you know that research, that we are born with only two natural fears? Fear of falling and fear of loud noises. We're all born with them. Those are natural. Okay? Which means all other fears are learned. Are learned. If I had time, I could unpack for you those high three or four fears that troubled me. And I really could explain to you how I learned them. It's just been hard to unlearn them. Okay? But my guess is my journey in many ways is similar to yours. Okay? Look at up. Uh, look at a couple of passages about where the sphere and uh, comes from and the origin of it. Uh, the uh, uh, next uh, uh, passage. Oh, keep going. I'm sorry. I bet. Oh, I'm going to stop that. Well, read those comments for a second. The relationship comes first. We must be with Him to become like Him. He wanted them to be spiritual warriors, unafraid of the powers of this world. We do the following. He does the making. Our mission, follow Jesus and lead others to do the same. They, the disciples, all struggled at first, but were changed and empowered by the resurrection. You know where those came from? You don't recognize any of us. How many of you were in one of the weekend services last week? Well, where the heck were the rest of you? What's going on here? Okay? All of those statements okay, were in uh, Pastor David's sermon last weekend. Okay? I know he said all of those in the one service that I was in except that our mission was. And I'm sitting there thinking, you got to remember, I know what we're studying and I know where we're going and I hear, David, you're reading my mail here. Okay? Uh, and I thought, these are uh, uh, excellent comments that tie into uh, to, you know, to what we're uh, looking at and looking at the demands for discipleship. And, uh, and, and as we move into today's, look at verse 26. Look at verse uh, 26 through 31. So, have no fear of them. Remember again, fear will be the natural reaction. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the house on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than the sparrows. Look at verse 26. Have no fear. Look down at verse 28. Do not fear those. Look at verse 31. Fear not. Three times, just a few verses. Jesus anticipating, follow me. It's going to be hard. Uh, it's going to be demanding. But don't be afraid. Do not develop a fearful spirit. Notice uh, uh, two things I want before I get into the details. I want to talk about fear. Go to the next slide. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us not, gave us a spirit not, of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So if we have fear, other than the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises uh, that are natural, is God the source of those fears? God is not the source of those. 
In fact, He gives us resources to deal with the fears, power, the energizing internal uh, power of the Holy Spirit to come to live in us, we come into a personal relationship with Christ, love, love for God, love for self, love for others, very kind, very encouraging, and self-control or, or discipline. Discipline. All of those resources at our disposal to deal with those fears that come into our life. Why? If we don't manage them, notice the outcome. Notice the result. Look at the next slide. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man, the fear of people. Of what they might say, do, or think. Uh, rejection, fear of rejection. Lays a snare. It entraps us. It baits us. It hunts us. It intimidates us. And if not managed, controls us. Controls them. So we, we've got this. Follow me. This is not going to be easy. The more you are like me, the more you may be treated like I was treated. And in these verses, I think Jesus gives us some reasons. Some reasons why you and I do not need to be afraid of, of the world. Of people that might oppose us or make fun of us. Uh, because we are following Christ. Okay? Uh, and this is what I see in the passage about how do you handle uh, the fears that come our way that will cause us to be less of a follower of Christ than we, than, we, uh, uh, than we should be. And a lot of times we get, because of this snare, we get spiritual watch on. And uh, I don't know about you, but typically the spiritual watch job that we get in terms of not being more of the witness for Christ's work in our life. It's easier for us to bear witness to a total stranger than it is to family and friends and co-workers. Right? It is hard. It's much more difficult. And the reason for that is those family and friends and co-workers They've probably seen us at our worst. They've seen the flaws. They've seen the failures. They've seen the shortcomings. And they know that we're a follower of Christ. And that really exposes us a whole lot more. So it's easier to witness to some guy or gal sitting next to you on a plane that you'll never ever see again. You get offended in forever. Just kidding. And, uh, and tell them about Jesus. Whereas talking to a family member or a co-worker, somebody that knows you well, makes it very, very difficult. So what are the three reasons that Jesus tells us not to be afraid of the world? Let's look at it. Okay, the first one is in verse 26. And I, and I, I, uh, I label this because God will vindicate His disciples, His followers. He's going to make it right. Listen, someday. Someday. Notice what it says in verse uh, uh, 26. Uh, in the ESV, the first word there is so. So, therefore, therefore, he's looking back, therefore, knowing that the more you are like me, therefore, knowing that the more you are like me, the more you will be treated as I was treated. Knowing that, therefore, have no fear of them. Have no fear of them. For, it, it, it's like saying, listen, don't look back at the fear that could come as a result of how the world will treat you for following me. Learn to look more forward. Look ahead. Look to the future. Notice what he says. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. In other words, there's a day, there's a time, there's a place when I'm going to make everything right. I'm going to vindicate those who do me and follow me no matter what price they pay to do that. I am going to, uh, uh, I'm going to handle, you don't have to, I'm going to handle an unbelieving world that mocked you, considered you intellectually weak, considered you to be uh, 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 
someone that uh, they were uncomfortable with when you worked with them or you lived with them and they made fun of you, I'm going to manage that. You don't have to manage that. I will someday. No matter how folks have treated me or you, you need to know that the time is coming that I'm going to vindicate you for being true to me. So keep Keep the longer look, not the shorter look. And one of the things that he promises here, in fact, turn to uh, turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. You could also write down Psalm uh, 73. I don't have time to read all of those, but have you ever? You don't have to raise your hand, but have you ever just kind of wondered where? Why do the wicked take the win? Okay? Why do the evil seem to get away with it? Uh, why do the non-Christian God hater some? Did they seem to be some of the uh, most prosperous? God says, you gotta remember got to learn to live with an eternal perspective and not a temporal perspective. I'm, I'm going to read a few verses, not, not all, there's some 40 uh, verses here in Psalm 37, but I want to give you the resource. If you ever have those kind of thoughts, you probably will. Psalm 37 and 73 are all about why do the wicked prosper? Why do the people who hate God seem to have better lives than a lot of the people who love God? Why? I mean, doesn't God see that? Is, doesn't, isn't God going to do something? He is. But probably later. Uh, Psalm 37, verse 1. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend the faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in Him and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as your light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in His way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger. Don't get angry. For say wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in abundant peace. That's a promise that, that though things are unfair, and unjust for us as believers. Probably now, certainly any more than I can recall in my lifetime toward believers. Jesus warns His disciples of which we listen, take the long term look, not the short term. In time, God is going to vindicate, make right for us as His followers. So just hold on and hang on. Until then, look at the uh, this quote, John Calvin. John Calvin got uh, uh, one of the great reformers, and uh, until he got banished because of his faith. John Calvin wrote, "Most assuredly, if I had merely served man, this would have been a poor reward or recompense. But it is my happiness that I have served Him, Christ, who never fails to reward His servant to the full extent of His promise." Just live more with an eternal perspective. Knowing God's going to take the injustices, the difficulties of time because of the fallenness of the lost world, and God is going to make those right in eternity. So, hang on. Hang on. Second, look at verse 27 and 28. And I think the second reason to be unafraid of the world is because what I call disciples must fear God above all. We, we, we've got to get fear in the right place. 
We've got to get this fear in the right place. Uh, another word, uh, uh, sometimes you hear the word venerate. To venerate someone, God, or other people, is, is to uh, kind of respect them and to hold them in, in, in awe. Notice what he says. The more, think about this, the more you and I fear God, respect God, love God, trust God, walk with God, the less we will fear people. I wish, there are so many times in my journey that I didn't speak up, didn't say, didn't interject an opportunity for God into the conversation because of fear of rejection or what they might say to me. And then only when usually the opportunity was gone and got off a plane or somewhere else and, the, and I'm sitting here and I'm just going, you idiot! Okay? The God in you is greater than that person sitting next to you and you couldn't speak up for me. Guilty! Guilty. Guilty. Fear God. Love God. Respect God. All God. More than anyone or anything. And the only one way to get there is to get to know Him better and better and better and better. I think this is part of, of what he's, he's referring to when He gets into verse 27. Okay, What I tell you in the dark, what I tell you in private, what I tell you in secret, how God speaks to us in our uh, uh, time with Him. What we're learning, what we're doing. Say it in the light. Speak it out. Speak it out. <laughs> many, many of us... Uh, struggle with this question that we really shouldn't. And that is, when somebody, and I used to, those people used to make me very uncomfortable going to say, Jimmy, hey, can you tell me what God's doing in your life today? Oh! Hey, tell, can, you, can you tell me what God said to you this morning? <clears throat> I remember something last week. Okay, I heard a great sermon Sunday week. It's this living in His presence. Certainly a concentrated, consistent time. But God should be constantly speaking and we're listening in private. And we should be able to give an account for the work that He's doing in our, in our, in our life. Notice what He says. And what you hear whispered, what the Holy Spirit, still small voice, whispers in your ear, proclaim, speak it out. Uh, we've got to learn to do a better job of listening to Him. And then being willing to voice that when appropriate. You say, but if I do that, especially at work, or maybe with some of my family, uh, uh, I'm going to get some uh, uh, backlash. Well, of course you are. Okay? But notice what he says again, fearing God more than fearing man. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him. I think that, sec that him is God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What's he say? He said, get your fear right. Uh, people may hate you and could, and they do that. Millions of Christians every year are, are slaughtered. For one reason, they're disciples of Christ. We generally, you know, we get verbally assaulted. But it doesn't really usually cost us. It may cost a job, but it doesn't cost us our lives. At least not yet. Uh, you know, anyways. But I remember, remember what Paul said to be absent from the body is to what? Yes. Present with the Lord. Now listen, you know, I, I love my life here. It's not a perfect life, but I love my life. And uh, I, I, you know, I've told you in the heavens that listen, I, I, I don't necessarily want to be on the next, uh, next, uh, next load, uh, uh, next uh, load to, 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 to heaven. But the worst thing that could happen to me if somebody shot me in the head today because I was a Christian is that I would go immediately to Jesus. That ain't bad. Okay, now I'm not looking for a crazy killer. Okay, none of us are. Okay, but in this world in which you and I live, we probably have less certainty than we've ever had that that could happen. And God forbid, God forbid, okay, but the worst thing that could happen is we go immediately in Jesus. That's not a bad trade. Yeah, I'm not looking for the next assassin. Next assassin. <laughs> Understand me. 
Okay? I'm just trying to put in perspective what I think Jesus is saying. Listen, I know fear is real. And I know it's going to cost a lot. And I know it's not going to be easy to follow. But do not be afraid of others because I'm going to straighten it all out in time and in eternity. I promise you I'll do that. And number two is, be sure that you love, respect, fear, and follow me more than anyone or anything else. And that will help you to manage the fear. Notice these two quotes. A couple of quotes. You'll recognize uh, the name. Uh, Lord Lawrence uh, said, He feared man so little because he feared God so much. <clears throat> I'd love to get there. Hey, look at the next one uh, by uh, John Knox. He feared God so much that he never feared any man. Never feared any I admire, some of you in the room, I admire, uh, I know, I know uh, 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 Ray and Lydia Holder that way, and I'm sure there are others that are in the room, I, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Ken and Nancy uh, Southers and some others that I can think, that I have always respected and admired them, that they were always, they're always unashamed and, and willing, you know, to speak up their faith. I, I admire them. I, I think some of that has to do with the gift of evangelism, but though we all, most of us don't have that gift, we all are still required to be his witnesses. Okay? And it doesn't mean it to be easy. Okay? It does mean that we need to speak up. And we can do that when we fear God more than we fear people. And then the last reason, verses 29 and 30, why we need to be unafraid of the world is disciples are precious and valued treasure to God. Every Christian has great value to God. Now look at the uh, look at the next verse. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? They would take these small birds, probably sparrows, similar to this, and they would literally kill them and 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 uh, and uh, put them on an open fire and eat them for hors d'oeuvres. Okay. And they were cheap. These are cheap birds. Okay, you could get uh, uh, you could get uh, two for a penny, or you could get five for two pennies. Got to be. Okay, got to say it. Are not two sparrows so for a penny? If not one of them will fall to the ground uh, apart from your father. Now, fall to the ground. We we would think primarily means when they die, okay. and it does. But the word here. It's very interesting. It teaches God not only knows when they die, God knows when they hop and when they stop hopping. That's what the word means. I know when they hop and I know when they stop hopping. I know when they're dead and I care for them. But even the hairs of your head are all on. That's pretty intimate knowledge. Okay. The average head, some of you are phallically challenged. <laughs> the average head has 144,000 hairs. That's the truth of the day. Got to take that with you. Okay. And they're all numbered. What, I think what Jesus is, 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 is trying to say, listen, if God cares for <laughs> Cheap birds that are killed and served as workers. And if God cares enough to count the hairs on our hands, aren't we, as the crown of His creation, valuable, precious, important to Him? Yes, we are. Look, look at your notes. I added there, and, and I could have added, I, I think, more, but these were the ones that came to my mind. Why are we so valuable to God? Because of creation. We are created in His image. Sparrows are not. We are created in His image. Because of redemption. We were bought with a price. Jesus gave His life for our salvation. He paid the ultimate Christ for us to come to a relationship uh, uh, with the Heavenly Father. And then third in the reign of war, I call glorification, that is 
We will eventually get to heaven, be with Him and others, and we will be like Him. Perfectly, attitudinally, and behaviors, not physically. So because of glorification, of what's going to happen in the, in the future in our lives. We are valuable uh, to God. Notice what he says. Look at verse uh, uh, 31. Fear not, therefore, again, because you are valuable, because you are cared for, that the, that the sparrows are cared for. Now, to, to wrap it up, I, I think, I just don't like what I see, sense, and feel that's going on in our culture. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned about the political divide, increasing political divide, because my hope has never been in the government. Never. And God forbid that it ever would be. I do have a growing concern that part of that cultural shift is an increasing uh, post-Christian and anti-Christian behavior. I am not optimistic that that's going to change. And I think Jesus' words here are very timely for us as disciples of Christ to be reminded that though we live in an increasingly hostile, this there is generally speaking not a favorable climate for followers of Christ. All the more so to be reminded, but don't be afraid. I know that's a natural reaction, but that didn't come from me, says God. And keep in mind, I'm going to make it all right someday. So I know. I know. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't get bad mouthed. Don't envy the wicked. Don't do that. Don't do it. It's, it, it's, 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 it's not worth it. Try to learn to know me and grow your relationship with me, that you respect me and fear me more than you fear anyone or anything else. And then there's no matter for you. You are really, really precious to me. Precious to me. Now, let me, let me close with uh, four or five verses. These are familiar verses. Uh, I've got from Paul, I've got James, but just want to remind you that this theme of struggling with the world. And uh, is uh, very is very common. Jesus talked about it, frankly, with some regularity. Uh, I want to look at some of the other New Testament writers and and, uh, and close with uh, some of, uh, some words from them. Listen to Paul in Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewal or renewing of your mind, that you may test the truth. Uh, uh, what is the will of God? It's good. We talked about this verse in the study of the will of God. God's will is good. It is acceptable and you can't improve on it because it is, it is uh, perfect. Doesn't mean that it's easy. Doesn't mean it's without price or pain. Not at all. But don't let the world because of fear squeeze you into its body. Look at the next uh, passage from John. A couple from the Gospel from, from uh, Apostle John. When I first John in the uh, Old Gospel. <coughs> Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in it. For all that is in the world, desire of the flesh, desire of the eyes, pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. What's going to happen? The world is passing away along with this desire. But whoever does the will of God, abides uh, Listen again to John. For everyone who has been born of God in relationship, notice three times, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcome, that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is that, uh, who is it that overcomes the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, you and I need to be overcomers. Okay? Uh, we don't ever need to, to, to say this. Well, how are we doing today? Well, okay, under the circumstances. Well, what in Jesus' name are you doing under there? <laughs> that doesn't mean circumstances are always easy. Circumstances can be horrific. It's just a matter of who you fear and who you respect and who you believe is in control. 
And then next, uh, this is James, a uh, couple of James, James 1 27. Religion that's pure, not defiled before God the Father is, the, is this. Is it orphans and widows? Take care of those, generally speaking, who may not necessarily take care of themselves, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And that's not easy. Okay? We live in a paintball world. And shooting stain at us all the time. Okay? Look at James 4 4. James says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is given to be with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Be careful. That's just the warning. Be careful. And then from Jesus, I mentioned John 15. If you are of the world, the world would love you as it's not. In other words, if we conform and fit in, it'd be easier. It would be. The world would love you as you but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they malign me, they're going to malign They're going to malign me. Okay? Next. John 16.33 I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Peace never means without kindness. In the world, you might have tribulation where there needs pressure. But they have courage. Don't be afraid. I have overcome the world, and you will too. And you will too. Okay? Uh, next. Here is a, uh, what I want you to do for uh, next week is to read Matthew 10. 24 to 33. We're only going to focus on 32, 33, which really connects in some way to uh, uh, being unafraid of, uh, of, of the world. Uh, I think next week, verses 32 and 33 has a really, really close uh, connect to it. Okay? And then I got two questions for you to uh, wrestle with at the table. Number one, what is your greatest obstacle in living? Remember, the whole, the whole bottom line premise is to be like Christ. What's your greatest obstacle in living more like Christ in a hostile world? How could you I mean, we know the goal in like Christ. We know that we have shortcomings. We all, we all do. What's the greatest obstacle? Are you being more like attitudes, ways, behaviors, values, priorities, and so on? And then third, I gave you three reasons out of the text of why we need to be unafraid of the world. Which one of those reasons gives you the most courage? Which one of those makes you want to walk out of here with a water pistol and take over the gates of hell? Okay? Right, let me pray. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for these very sobering teachings that you give to us through your Son. These are hard. These are difficult. We need to hear them. Uh, we need to be reminded that it's great to be a Christian. No, it's great now and in eternity. But there is a price. There is a price to become more and more like you. And if you have laid that promise, really great promise, you don't need to be afraid. Because you knew that would be the natural response. Because I have provided you the resources to deal with and manage that fear. Lord, bless the time and the conversation around the tables. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.